Hey, it's Brett. This is Brett in some books. Today we are continuing The Silver Chair, which is the fourth book in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. We're reading chapter 13, The Underland Without the Queen. All felt that they had earned what Scrub called a breather. The witch had locked the door and told the earthmen not to disturb her, so there was no danger of interruption for the present. Their first business, of course, was Puddle Glum's burnt foot. After a couple of clean shirts from the prince's bedroom, torn into strips and well greased on the inside with butter and salad oil off the supper table, made a fairly good dressing. When this had been applied, they all sat down and had a little refreshment and discussed plans for escaping from the underworld. Rillian explained that there were quite a lot of outlets by which one could get to the surface. He had been taken out through one of the most through most of them at one time or another, but he had never gone out alone, only with the witch, and he had always reached those outlets by going in a ship across the sunless sea. What the earthmen would say if he said if he went down to the harbor without the witch and with three strangers, and simply ordered a ship, no one could guess. But most likely they would ask awkward questions. On the other hand, the new outlet, the one for the invasion of the overworld, was on this side of the sea, and only a few miles away. The prince knew that it was nearly finished. Only a few feet of earth divided the diggings from the outer air. It was even possible that it had now been quite finished. Perhaps the witch had come back to tell him this and to start the attack. Even if it was not, they could probably dig themselves out by that route in a few hours if they could only get there without being stopped and if only they found the diggings unguarded. But those were the difficulties. If you ask me, said Puddle Glum when Scrub interrupted, I say, he asked, what is that noise? I've been wondering that for some time, said Jill. They had all, in fact, been hearing the noise, but it had begun and increased so gradually that they did not know when they had first noticed it. For a time, it had been only a vague disquiet like gentle winds or traffic from far away. Then it swelled to a murmur like the sea. Then came rumblings and rushings, now there seemed to be voices as well, and a steady roaring that was not voices. By the lion, said Prince Rillian, it seems this silent land has found a tongue at last. He rose and walked to the window and drew aside the curtains. The others crowded round him to look out. The very first thing they noticed was a great red glow. Its reflection made a red patch on the roof of the underworld thousands of feet above them so that they could see a rocky ceiling which had perhaps been hidden in darkness ever since the world was made. The glow itself came from the far side of the city so that many buildings, grim and great, stood up blackly against it. But it also cast its light down many streets that ran from it toward the castle. And in those streets... Something very strange was going on. The closely packed, silent crowds of earthmen had vanished. Instead, there were figures darting about by ones or twos or threes. They behaved like people who did not want to be seen, lurking in shadow behind buttresses or in doorways, and then moving quickly across the door into the fresh places of hiding. But the strangest thing of all to anyone who knew gnomes was the noise. Shouts and cries came from all directions, but from the harbor there came a low, rumbling roar, which grew steadily louder and was already shaking the whole city. "'What's happened to the earthmen?' said Scrub. "'Is it them shouting?' "'Tis hardly possible,' said the prince. I never heard one of the rascals so much as speak with a loud voice in all the weary years of my bondage. Some new devilry, I don't doubt. And that is what the red light is over there? Asked Jill. Is something on fire? If you ask me, said Puddle Glum, 
I should say that that was the central fires of the earth breaking out to make a new volcano. We'll be in the middle of it, I shouldn't wonder. Look at that ship, said Scrub. Why is it coming on so quickly? No one's rowing it. Look, look, said the prince. The ship is already far this side of the harbor. It is in the street. Look. And all the ships are driving the city. All the ships are driving into the city. By my head, the sea's rising. The flood is upon us. Aslan be praised. This castle stands on high ground. But the water comes on grimly fast. Oh, what can be happening? cried Joe. Fire and water and all those people dodging about the streets. I'll tell you what it is, said Puddleglum. That witch has laid a train of magic spells so that whoever, she, whenever she was killed, at that same moment her whole kingdom would fall to pieces. She's the sort that wouldn't much mind dying herself if she knew that the chap who killed her was going to be burned or buried or drowned five minutes later. Has hit it, friend Wiggle, said the prince. When our swords hacked off the witch's head, that stroke ended all her magic works, and now the deep lands are falling to pieces. We are looking at the end of the underworld. That's it, sir, said Puddleglum, unless it should happen to be the end of the whole world. But are we just going to stay here and wait? gasped Joe. Not by my counsel, said the prince. I would save my horse, coal, back, coal black, and the witch's snowflake, a noble beast and worthy of a better mistress, which are both stabled in the courtyard. After that, let us make shift to get out to high ground and pray that we shall find an outlet. The horses can carry two each at need, and if we put them to it, they may outstrip the flood. Will your highness not put on armor? asked Puddle Glum. I don't like the look of those. And he pointed down to the street. Everyone looked down. Dozens of creatures, and now that they were close, they obviously were earthmen, were coming up from the direction of the harbor. But they were not moving like an aimless crowd. They behaved like modern soldiers in an attack, making rushes and taking cover, anxious not to be seen from the castle windows. I dare not see the inside of that armor again, said the prince. I rode in it as in a movable dungeon, and it stinks of magic and slavery, but I will take the shield. He left the room and returned with the strange light in his eyes a moment later. Look, friends, he said, holding out the shield toward them. An hour ago it was black and without device. Now this. The shield had turned bright as silver, and on it, rather than blood or cherries, was the figure of the lion. Doubtless, said the prince, this signifies that Aslan will be our good lord, whether he means us to live or die, and all's one for that. Now, by my counsel, we shall all kneel and kiss his likeness, and then we shall shake hands with one another as true friends that may shortly be parted, and then let us descend into the city and take the adventure that is sent us. And they all did as the prince had said. But when Scrub shook hands with Jill, he said, So long, Jill. Sorry I've been in a funk and so ratty. I hope you get home safe. And Jill said, So long, Eustace, and I'm sorry I've been such a pig. And this was the first time they had ever used Christian names, because one didn't do it at school. The prince unlocked the door, and they all went down the stairs, three of them with drawn swords, and Jill withdrawn knife. The attendants had vanished, and the great room at the foot of the prince's stairs was empty. The gray, doleful lamps were still burning, and by their light they had no difficulty in passing gallery, gallery after gallery, and descending stairway after stairway. The noises from the outside of the castle were not so easily heard here as they had been in the room above. Inside the house, all was still as death and deserted. It was as they turned a corner into the great hall on the ground floor that they met their first earthman, a fat, whitish creature with a very pig-like face, 
who was gobbling up all the remains of food on the table. It squealed, the squeal was also very like a pig's, and darted under a bench, whisking its long tail out of Puddle Glum's reach just in the nick of time. And it rushed away through the far door too quickly to be followed. From the hall they came in out into the courtyard. Jill, who went to a riding school in the holidays, had just noticed the smell of a stable, a very nice, honest, homely smell it is to meet in a place like Underland, when Eustace said, Great Scott, look at that! A magnificent rocket had risen from somewhere beyond the castle walls and broken into green stars. Fireworks? said Jill in a puzzled voice. Yes, said Eustace, but you can't imagine those earth people letting them off for fun. It must be a signal. It means no good to us, I'll be bound, said Puddleglum. Friends, said the prince, when once a man is launched on such an adventure as this, he must bid farewell to hopes and fears. Otherwise death or deliverance will both come too late to save his honor and his reason. Oh, my beauties. He was opening the stable door. Hey, cousins, steady, coal black. Softly now, Snowflake, you are not forgotten. The horses were both frightened by the strange lights and the noises. Jill, who had been so cowardly about going through a black hole between one cave and another, went in without fear between the stamping and snorting beasts, and she and the prince had them saddled and bridled in a few minutes. Very fine they looked as they came out into the courtyard, tossing their heads. Jill mounted Snowflake, and Puddleglum got up behind her. Eustace got up behind the prince on coal black. Then, with a great echo of hoofs, they rode out of the main gateway into the street. Not much danger of being burnt, that's the bright side of it, observed Puddleglum, pointing to their right. There, hardly a hundred yards away, Lapping at the walls of the houses was water. Courage, said the prince. The road there goes down steeply. The water has climbed only half up the greatest hill in the city. It might come so near as the first half hour, and come no nearer than in the next two. My fear is of more than that. He pointed to, with his sword, to a great tall earthman with boar's tusks followed by six others with a short of assorted shapes and sizes who had just dashed out of a side street and stepped into the shadow of the houses where no one could see them. The prince led them, aiming always in the direction of the glowing red light, but a little to the left of it. His, hand, his plan was to get round the fire, if it was a fire, onto high ground in hopes that they might find their way into the new diggings <clears throat> Unlike the other three, he seemed to be almost enjoying himself. He whistled as he rode and sang snatches of an old song about Cor and Thunderfist of Archenland. The truth is, he was so glad at being free from his long enchantment that all dangers seemed to game in comparison, but the rest found it an eerie journey. And here is an illustration of what's going on. Behind them was the sound of <clears throat> clashing and entangled ships and the rumble of collapsing buildings. Overhead was the great patch of lurid light on the roof of the underworld. Ahead was the mysterious glow, which did not seem to grow any bigger. From the same direction came the continual hubbub of shouts, screams, catcalls, laughter, squeals, and bellowings and fireworks of all sorts rose in the air. No one could guess what they meant. Nearer to them, the city was partly lit up by the red glow and partly by the very different light of the dreary gnome lamps. But there were many places where neither of these lights fell, and those places were jet black. And in all of those places, in and out, the shapes of earthmen were darting and slipping all the time, always with their eyes fixed on the travelers, 
always trying to keep out of sight themselves. There were big and little faces, huge eyes like fish's eyes and little eyes like bears. There were feathers and bristles, horns and tusks, noses like whipcord and chains and chins so long that they looked like beards. And every now and then a group of them would get too big or come too near. Then the prince would brandish his sword and make a show of charging them, and the creatures, with all manner of hootings, squeakings, and cluckings, would dive away into the darkness. But when they had climbed many steep streets and were far away from the flood, and almost out of the town on the inland side, it began to be more serious. They were now close to the red glow and had nearly on a level on it, though they still could not see what it really was. But by its light they could see their enemies more clearly. Hundreds, perhaps a few thousands, of gnomes were all moving toward it, but they were doing so in short rushes, and whenever they stopped they turned and faced the travelers. If your highness asked me, said Puddleglum, I'd say those fellows were meaning to cut us off in front. That was my thought too, Puddle Glum, said the prince, and we can never fight our way through so many. Hark you, let us ride forth close by the edge of yonder house, and even as we reach it do you slip off into its shadow. The lady and I will go forward a few paces. Some of these devils will follow us, I doubt not. They are thick behind us. Do you, who have long arms, take one alive if you may, as it passes your ambush, we may get a true tale of it, or learn what is quarrel against us. But there's the others, but won't the others all come rushing at us to rescue the one we catch? said Jill, in a voice not so steady as she tried to make it. Then, madam, said the prince, you shall see us die fighting around you, and you must commend yourself to the lion. Now, good puddle glum. The marsh wiggle slipped off into the shadow as quickly as a cat. The others, for a sickening minute or so, went forward at a walk. Then suddenly, from behind them, there broke out a series of blood-curdling screams, mixed with the familiar voice of Puddle Glum, saying, Now then, don't cry out before you're hurt, or you will be hurt, see? Anyone would think of that as a pig being killed. That was good hunting! exclaimed the prince, immediately turning coal black and coming back to the corner of the house. Eustace, he said, of your courtesy, take coal black's head. Then he dismounted, and all three gazed in silence, while Puddle Glum pulled his catch out into the light. It was a most miserable little gnome, only about three feet long. It had a sort of ridge, like a cock's comb, only hard, on the top of its head, little pink eyes and a mouth and chin so large and round that its face looked like that of a pygmy hippopotamus. If they had not been in such a tight place, they would have burst into laughter at the sight of it. Now, earth man, said the prince, standing over it and holding his sword point very near the prisoner's neck, speak up like honest gnome and you shall be free. Play the knave, with us, and you will be a dead earthman. Good puddle glum, how can it speak while you hold its mouth tight shut? No, and it can't bite either, said puddle glum. If I had the silly soft hands you humans have, saving your highness's reverence, I'd have been all over blood by now. Yet even a marsh wiggle gets tired of being chewed. Sarah, said the prince to the gnome, one bite and you die. Let its mouth open, Puddle Glum. Ooh, ee, ee, squealed the earthman. Let me go, let me go. It isn't me. I didn't do it. Didn't do what? Whatever your honors say I did do, answered the creature. Tell me your name, said the prince, and what you earthmen are all about today. Oh, please, your honors. Please, kind gentlemen, whimpered the gnome. Promise you will not tell the Queen's Grace anything I say. The Queen's Grace, as you call her, the prince said sternly, is dead. I killed her myself.
What? cried the gnome, opening its ridiculous mouth wider in astonishment. Dead! The witch dead! And by your honor's hand! It gave a huge sigh of relief and added, Why then your honor is a friend! The prince withdrew his sword an inch or so. Puddle Glum let the creature sit up. It looked round on the four travelers with its twinkling red eyes and chuckled once or twice and began. That is the end of chapter 13.